Well, it's, it's an honor to be here. I love this conference, and uh, boy, those are great talks. That was fascinating. We've been watching some sports cars race, and now we're going to get into a little bit of the engine. It'll be a little bit old school. Um, I'm a little mixed feeling about the title of the group. I didn't know it was Big Thinkers. Um, it reminds me of about 15 years ago, I have five kids, and we were having some lunch after Sunday church, and uh, my oldest had just gotten back from college, her first semester there, and was saying uh, random facts that she learned, you know, how wise you get with one semester of college. So uh, she said, you know, for the first time ever, the life expectancy of American males has gone down. And, uh, and then the hypothesis was obesity. And my youngest went, oh, Dad! And I, I had mixed feelings about that. I was, I was impressed with her analytic powers. I was, I was moved by her love. But anyway, I was, uh, so the big thinkers group. I'm a little, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. But anyway, it's been a fascinating three uh, sessions. And uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts. Um, uh, one advantage of being a little older is you can say, ah, back in my day, we did this, you know. And so what are the top three things if I were to impart in 30 minutes? Um, and those three, I want to talk about ensembles, the idea of using multiple models, competing models cooperatively, target shuffling. The key question in statistics is, how likely is my finding to be real? How likely could I have gotten this result by chance? You know, there are a lot of spurious correlations out there, and the more powerful our algorithms are, the more likely they are to happen. And most people fall prey to uh, believing in it, and also publishing industry uh, has a really hard time deciding what is real and what won't be, and there's actually a crisis in that field. And then the third one's a little more, a little more in, uh, detailed, and it's uh, one of the top 10 mistakes that people make. I'll talk some about those tomorrow. And I just picked out the, my favorite, leaks from the future. Using data in your training that you don't have access to in the real world. It's astonishing how often that happens. Um, I do also want to pay passing notice to uh, cognitive biases, the ways that we <laughs> carbon-based life forms are set up, uh, the way we've been reinforced, trained over the years and generations and millennia. We, we aren't well suited for thinking logically, and it's much worse than we think, and I highly recommend books on that subject. Uh, I won't talk about that today, I'll do a little bit tomorrow, but it, the great obstacle in analytics isn't as much the technical part. The technical part is absolutely essential, being able to solve the problem, have it work on out-of-sample data, unseen before. Almost all projects succeed there. Where they fail is people actually using them people actually implementing the beautiful thing you've created. So think of it as a chef who had created a custom meal for a guest, they pay for it, but as the day is over, they notice it's been scraped into the trash uneaten. And, and it's just, there's something wrong with that picture. So how can we get our environment? And that was great for uh, Constant to point out the incredible amount of work in the environment beyond the machine learning. So while we're focusing on the machine learning, we really need to remember that the problem around that and the problem of getting people to use our work is sometimes the greatest, the greatest hurdle, and I have some statistics on that. But again, we'll focus on the, the technical stuff for, for today and starting with ensembles. So the idea of using multiple nonlinear modeling techniques, they have all sorts of different kinds. They're uh, using the data, using models that parametrically estimate the data, some are differentiable. Uh, some can work with small amounts of data, and they have lots of different ways of connecting the dots. You know, all of data science depends on a smoothness assumption that if you're close in the X space, you're sort of, you should be close in the Y space. And so the nearest neighbor algorithm, which that friend of yours in junior high used to use, you know, for the answer, and you take the nearest neighbor's answer and write it down, uh, and uh, is actually a good, is a good one because it, it makes use of that smoothness idea that if you're close in this space, in the input space, your outputs are probably okay. A chaotic space would be one that's deterministic but not smooth, so you can't do any kind of inference backwards from data into a general theory from chaotic data because there's no smoothness. So uh, when you find problems that are, are smooth, that, that have some relationship, it can be nonlinear between inputs and outputs. That's very amenable to any kind of inductive modeling technique. But which is the best? There's lots of, uh, of critiques out there. We a, a, did a study years ago, and here's just uh, an out-of-sample accuracy, lower is better in this case, uh, for five different algorithms on six different problems. 
And so overall, the lowest, the lowest of, of the group there is neural nets, the, the red one. And this is an expert user of neural nets. These are not yet deep learning nets. This is uh, old school neural nets. But there is a difference between a naive user and an expert user of the tools. And this was a fair race between people who were proponents of those tools. And this is their out of sample score. And neural nets win overall in this case. They're, they're very competitive. I teach them as one of the top four techniques you should use in your toolkit. Um, even though I hated neural nets as a youngster, I was on the, uh, they were so overhyped and uh, the astonishing amount of, of hype around them. So it's wonderful to see deep learning coming around, the third, the third generation of neural nets. And um, it's going through the hype cycle of the technology trigger, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment. But it will, it will prove, and it has already proven, extremely valuable and it's worth paying attention to. It's just hard to endure all of the explosion and noise during, the, during that, that, that rapid rise, uh, but it, it is worth it because at the end, the things that will hand up. So, but one a proponent of each of these techniques could be happy because all of them come in first or second at least twice. And so, uh, traditionally, one has tried to see, look at the properties of the problem and see which algorithm might do better out of sample, and that, it's worthy, but there is a better way. And the ensemble idea, this is just averaging the predictions of those competing methods, taking the five different models, taking their, their estimates, averaging those together, and making a sixth estimate out of it. Or you could vote, and voting is arguably a little better in this case, because it wins more often. And so that's an incredibly simple version of ensembles. I was creating new versions of ensembles, and they do a tiny bit better, but the key idea is that basically all reasonable ways of combining disparate, competing, independently developed models tends to help. It doesn't always, unless it's decision trees. In the case of decision trees, an ensemble of decision trees has always so far beaten a single decision tree out of sample in every, in every situation I've ever seen for two decades. So that's pretty interesting. It smooths the decision tree. Decision tree is not very smooth but an ensemble makes, uh, instead of crude stair steps, more. And we'll see that in a second here. Here's a, a tough problem for a decision tree. Draw this circle, separate the red from the blue, and the best it can do is this crude picture that only a mother could love. You know, uh, put it up on the fridge, Johnny's picture of a circle. You know, but um, anyway, when you use uh, bagging, bootstrapped aggregating, you build 100 different trees that have all been handicapped in some way by not looking at some of the data. Uh, or doubly looking at some of the data, and when you find the, uh, the trade-off there, the 50-50 point, you get something that's much closer to a circle. It's still a decision tree, it's still an etch-a-sketch toy, you know, with only the ability to draw north-south, east-west lines, but it comes closer to a circle, it smooths it out, and it doesn't overfit. Putting 100 trees together that have been built separately is not an overfit, even though the number of parameters is vastly greater. It's a very interesting phenomenon. In fact, it's simpler. This tree is actually statistically simpler than that first one that we put up on the fridge. So that I won't go into, but uh, that's an interesting, interesting result. And here, if you have a bunch of different decision trees, the lift charts of what happens when you go a certain depth into the list, how much of the return do you get, how many of the sales do you get, or if you're investigating fraud, how much fraud do you get back. These are different implementations of trees built on different subsets of the data, but if you put them together as an ensemble, you get something that has many more cut points, many more places where you can distinguish between characters and the lift chart is smoother. So ensembles are, and, and that simple, that tree in the middle is again simpler than any of its components in a statistical sense, in terms of sensitivity to noise from the input training. And then a last example for ensembles, a very practical one, credit scoring. If you use one method at a time, lower is better here. Uh, so the Mars technique wins slightly over neural nets. Um, but if you use a pairwise techniques, or three at a time, four at a time, five at a time, you see that Although there's an occasional outlier that's uh, a scary thing up there doing worse than the individual models, that in general, the more models you put together, uh, the better it gets. And again, that does not, that's not subject to overfit. So ensembles are a key, uh, a key result and, uh, and heavily used at, to, good, to good effect. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is significance, finding finding how likely, the key question in statistics is how likely could I have gotten something that interesting? Not how likely could I have gotten that, but how could have, that got my interest for some reason? 
if things were random, something would get my interest. There's always some best location that we'll see in a minute. But if, how likely could that best location have come by chance? That's the key question in statistics. And statistics is the hardest subject to master in school. It's the least well caught. Uh, I was teaching data science to a bunch of data, uh, statistics professors, and they heard me say taught. I didn't say it was the least well taught. That is sometimes the problem, but it's the least well caught. Most people don't remember enough except to pass the last quiz or exam, and then it fades from memory. Because if you think about it, it's a combination of you know, higher order math and Buddhism. You know, this reality you see is but one possible reality. Now, calculate this integral, you know, so it's a tough thing. But it's so much better if we do it instead with simulation, if we do it the way it, statistics was intended, cards and dice, back to when rich mathematicians, rich, no, there's no such thing as a rich mathematician, sorry, rich uh, gamblers were, were hiring poor mathematicians to solve odds problems for them. So that's, that's where statistics started. So anyway, um, Target shuffling just takes that idea, and we'll look at it in a second. But first, I have to establish the motive or the, the motivation. What's going on? There is a crisis in science, the, the problem of irreproducible results. Now, Lancet is a good paper across the pond here, and a good, a good journal. They only take about one out of 20 of already self-selected submissions, but they themselves believe that half of what they publish is false. It cannot be reproduced. Um, Johnny Unitas, who's a famous and brilliant Greek a doctor, uh, has done a lot of studies on medical, and he believes that 90% of medical journal articles are worthless. 90%. Uh, Amgen tried to replicate studies that their entire business depends on. It could only do about six out of the 58. Bayer, the same thing, got a little bit better. 25% of the 67 studies that they rely on, they couldn't replicate when they went to all the trouble to do that. Recently, down the street from me, the University of Virginia, someone there led a replication study of 100 different psychology studies, and only 36% of them had got results in the same direction when they were tried again. And that paper won result of the year in 2015 by Science Magazine. And here's a chart where the original string effect size is the x-axis, the replication study where someone's trying to follow the recipe and repeat the result is the y-axis, and you would hope that everything would be along that 45-degree angle line, but instead, two-thirds of the time, it's, it's different significantly in the wrong direction. And you can see there are many cases where the effect size was positive the first time, and literally not, not just nothing, but negative in the, in the repeat study. In fact, the person who led the study, one of those dots is his, and it's red. So he was asked, well, what is that, what, what is that about? He said, well, they must not have done the replication right. <laughs> and he was not ready to abandon the results of this, even though it was a study he'd set up. So lots of fascinating stories in there. Again, this is the best science papers from that year that are being tested the best psychology papers. And lest you think psychology, that's a soft field, which it is, you know, uh, you know that's not, the, that's not as, as good as, as chemistry or physics or me mechanical engineering or whatever. The same types of results are there where a majority of people have not been able to replicate their own results and an even larger majority have friends that had that problem. So, uh, yeah, if you always want to know about some, how someone's doing, there's a famous study of recycling when it was kind of a new idea. Uh, how much do you recycle? They would, and it was kind of available commercially. You could pay extra to have someone, you know, you could work harder to separate your trash and pay extra to have someone come. What a deal. Anyway, um, and, the, uh, and the, you ask a, a a homeowner, how much do you recycle? Oh, mm, recycling. And then how much does your neighbors, mm, not very much. But when they stole the trash from the homeowners and counted it, this was a great estimate of how much you recycled. So what you suspect of your neighbor tells more about you than about your neighbor, which is very, it's a, sort of a universal truth. There's, there's some news you can use as you take home. Um, all righty, so this is the problem. Even the best studies in each field have very difficult trouble being replicated. And science depends on replication. It depends on a finding being real. If you're finding an association between you know, what somebody looks at and clicks in the recommendation engine to what they buy next, you would like that to hold up and not send them away. By the way, there was a, a, uh, 
an organization that built a recommendation engine for a, a startup, and the startup went out of business six weeks later after implementing it. And the, and the recommendation engine worked fine. They just had one little flaw. They had the sign wrong. So they were showing you the products you were least likely to be interested in, and that didn't help sales uh, at all. But anyway, here, here the sign is right. People are doing what, what, the, what the study tells them, and two-thirds of the time, it is nothing or worse. And so it reminds me, I don't know if any of you are, uh, are Etsy fans, but it reminds me of those beautiful you know, cakes or something that people build, and then someone follows the procedure to the letter, and they get <laughs> something else. You know? this, is, this is the state of research. You, know, you have this beautiful you know, chicky pops, and you get this result, you know, or, or this lovely idea for a Christmas letter with a new arrival and it just doesn't work out in practice, you know. So this is unfortunately the state of research all over the world right now. And so we've got to do better. So I have a technique, and I won't go into the nitty-gritty details of it today, except I'll show you a demo, which hopefully you'll get the idea, that really solves the technical problem of recalibrating and tell us how likely. You know, the statistical tests were invented by those geniuses a century ago in statistics that said, what's the likelihood that you've made this draw of a certain proportion from this population size? It works if you try one thing, but nobody ever tries one thing, right? We try a hundred or a million different things. Data science is a hypothesis-generating machine, and we cherry-pick those results and then use the statistical tests, and they just lower and lower and lower the thresholds. I mean, why is a publication threshold for a medical journal 5%? If they really believe that was statistically right, they're saying it has to be true 19 out of 20 times. But wouldn't you take a drug that was right two out of three times? I mean, if, I mean, if the chances were that good. In fact, drug, drug is not, no drug is actually that effective. I worked with Pharmacy and Upjohn and helped them discover one of their drugs that they, did, that they developed in a, in a, in a decade-long period, one of the three drugs that they and Pfizer developed in that period. And I learned from them a lot. I learned that, for instance, that 70 to 80 percent of the effect of a drug is the... Is the um, effect that you get when you put nothing in it. What's that? The placebo effect. There you go. I'm starting to need drugs myself. So uh, the placebo effect, where you just are in the right setting and someone hands you something, even if it has no compound in it, accounts for the majority of the effect of even blockbuster commercial drugs that have been approved by agencies. So, so the, the level of effectiveness of medicine when you get into the data is actually very scary, very low. And um, drugs that passed 10 years ago wouldn't pass today because the placebos are much better than ever before. Uh, people in social media are describing, oh, I'm in the study and I feel really sick in the morning. Wait, you feel sick? I don't feel sick. I'm quitting. I'm in the control group. So they put side effects in all the, the placebos now, and the placebos work better than ever. So anyway, uh, we, need that. we need that thing actually in every other field. We need actually a good placebo test. What would be the effect of just running data science on randomized data? And so target shuffling basically does that. Let me take an example. This is from baseball, where you have a strike, a strike zone where you're throwing pitches, and uh, only a fraction of them, about 9%, are hits, where the person gets on base safe. But you can imagine there's a lot of fields where, where people are divided like this, their geographical location, their age, their gender, and so forth. You put them in boxes, and you say, what subset of my customers or my patients or whatever respond best to this treatment? Or, and in this case, the, the interesting case is a hit or a red ball. So if you search through the space, you can use p-values to tell you how interesting a subpopulation is in terms of its ratio of red to blue and its count. If it was 2 out of 4, that would be interesting, but not as interesting as 10 out of 20. Same ratio, but a bigger count. And the p-value takes that into account. So it's a great interestingness measure, but it's not a probability unless you do just one thing. When you do multiple things, it's, it's, it loses its, its interpretation as a probability, but it's still interesting, an interestingness measure. So take your interestingness measure, find the, the best spot, and it turns out that's going to be the best spot. That has 9 out of 37 hits, so it's got a rate of one quarter of the time, and it's a significant population. That is the most interesting hot spot in this data. So if, after we've searched it all, we identify that was the winner, and what was its score? It was a third of a percent. It says there's a third of a percent chance that something that dense in redness with that larger population could have happened given this data. But it's not a third of a percent chance after you've checked all you know, 120 different boxes. 
You've, you've cherry-picked now. It's not interpretable as a percentage anymore. It was the chance of rolling a six. If you roll a die, it's one out of six. But what if you roll that die 10 times? The chance of your best result being a six is much, much higher. So that's exactly what's happening with data science. We're trying multiple, we're trying millions of different things. And the more powerful our algorithm is, the more likely we're going to find a spurious correlation, unless we have a lot of data to, to correct us. But we can calibrate these things by just modifying the data. So there the data is literally the same as before. Look at it, I'm just going to go back and forth between these. Look at one data point, a red one, and it's probably blue this next time around. I shuffled that 9% of, I didn't change the physics, didn't change the inputs, I just changed the output label, the target variable, target shuffling. Now, there's going to be, in this new data, some point that's most interesting, and it turns out to be in a different location. The location doesn't matter as much as the interestingness measure. This was the most interesting thing on, on randomly labeled data, with the same proportion of reds, but now the location was different, and there was still a hot spot. There's always a hot spot, right? just by chance. Well, it thinks it's interesting, not quite as interesting as the previous real result, so that's good, but still quite interesting. Well, we just do this many, many times and get a histogram of how often it beats it. That would be on the left-hand side. So after 10 trials, of two of our examples have beaten it. After 100, 15% have beaten, and after 1,000, 18%. So it hasn't quite converged yet, but we say that roughly one out of five randomized labelings of the cases results in a finding more interesting than our original finding. And that's the key question in statistics. How likely could I have been fooled? How likely could I have found something as interesting as my real result, or better, by chance alone? So we've created a world where the null hypothesis rules, where there is no linkage between the target variable and the input variables, and we counted how many times we got a better result. It's a very simple procedure solving a very subtle problem of over-search. You've heard of overfit, where things are fit too tightly to the data. Over-search, you can have relatively simple models. You can just look at a million of them or a billion of them. And that's a different kind of complexity that's completely hidden because it doesn't show up in the final model. It's part of the, the invisible process that got you there. Target shuffling takes that into account, can give you a calibrated number, and now if you were a business person, the sports manager, and you had a four out of five chance that this hot spot is real, and by the way, that was a bunch of batters mixed together, they do it now for individual batters, <laughs> so they, the hitting is a lot harder now because of analytics, unfortunately. It makes baseball even more boring. I was in, I was in, the, I was in a restaurant in Boston yesterday, it seems, it must be, yeah, it was yesterday, and watching uh, different sports was up there, and it took me three or four minutes to realize that the baseball channel was frozen. <laughs> so, anyway, so, all right. All right, third one, leaks from the future. Real-world examples. Um, neural nets. The hype around neural nets is great, and the reality is good, but it also means that the false findings are even greater, because what happens is people say, this is how the brain works, or I believe that. They have this irrational belief in the goodness of their results. And the trouble is, when you get too good results, they're too good to be true for a reason. They're not true. So when a, a PhD computer scientist guy using a neural net many years ago was asked to forecast future interest rates for a bank in Chicago, he did, and he got 95% accuracy. And they said, that's too good to be true. And he said, well, no one this smart has ever tried. You know, but anyway, the, the, so they had to give it to somebody else to find the problem. And it took days, which is kind of embarrassing, because the end result was one of the inputs was the output variable. So with future interest rates and a lot of other things, you could only, you could only lose 5% of the information and predict what future interest rates were. So anyway... A regression would have found that relationship right away, by the way. So that's why I always say run multiple different techniques on the data. Once you've done all the hard work of prepping the data, it's really easy to try multiple techniques. Uh, I, work in the, I work in the hedge fund industry a lot, and there was, uh, I'm the killer of dreams, really, you know, because folks make it to me, and then we find a bug in their stuff. So one of the, one of the stories there, most of the time, nine out of ten times, um, one of the stories there was a, a model that was 70% right in predicting tomorrow's S&P increase or decrease. And it used thousands of lines of code of a fourth generation language. And uh, after much trouble, I was able to ac accurately 100% reproduce their results 
with a three-day moving average. Now, that would have been bad, except the three-day moving average centered on today. So with yesterday's price, today's price, and tomorrow's price, 70% of the time, they could get tomorrow's price direction right. I said, you know, if you drop a data point, you could get 100% right. No, no I didn't say that. I, you know, you, it's, a, it's a sad thing. So they did not know that that was what their huge model had devolved to, and there was an off-by-one error in training, and they were off the races, wearing suits, flying places, showing fancy PowerPoints, getting investment, we, we were able to help them before they had to go to jail for fraud, you know. So they didn't, they didn't have to go to jail because they, they stopped and sent the money back until they could fix this major problem. But it's amazing how far things go. Uh, an insurance company had data for predicting upsell, how much, uh, you know, AAA is an is a, uh, uh, auto emergency uh, roadside assistance kind of program. They have a wide selection of customers. It's a, it's a pretty good deal. And they try to upsell those customers to get their auto insurance, their motorcycle insurance, their boat insurance, whatever they, they offer. And so they're sort of constantly bugging them. Well, there was one, one candidate input variable that if it had, it was blank most of the time, but if it was non-blank, a decision tree said, look, if this non-blank, there is a quarter of your purchasers here over here, and it's 100% purchasers. There are no non-purchasers in this group. Again, red lights should go off. Too good to be true, right? But the data was all, you know, we're saying there's something wrong with this variable. No, no, that's all a legal variable. Spin. Ultimately, we found out it was a cancellation code. It was, it, was the, it was how they canceled their insurance, which obviously occurs after they buy their insurance, not before. And, you know, I have, I have multiple examples. Vanguard, an ad that Vanguard showed all over the, all over the world on the web, has an incredibly, and they have great advice for how to do back tests in there. And then their, and then their example that they show breaks that law. And they have a, a, a horrible example. I'll, I'll hope to detail more tomorrow. Um, data mining salary survey that might interest some people. It was shown by a, a startup company that trains data scientists or trains people to be data scientists from other careers that if you negotiate, on average, your salary goes up 3%. Well, who are they interviewing? the ones that successfully got the job. What is another possibility of negotiating? <laughs> not getting the job, right? But because those people don't have the title, they're not interviewed, and so you don't get that data. It's a survivor bias problem. You know, the famous example of World War II, when there were planes were returning to Britain from bombing runs, they, they measured where all the holes were. They're in the wings, so we obviously need to put more metal on the wings. It's like, wait a minute, somebody realized, wait a minute, these are the ones that came back. We need to put metal where these ones don't have shots because if they have shots and they made it back, they survived the ones that... So anyway, you just have to think backwards. What could have happened to my data before I got it? What kind of filters did it go through? And are those, are those going to be the filters that a new data point out in the wild is going to have? You know, when I teach this, I often ask people after they learn the top 10 data mining mistakes, you know, which ones have you seen in practice? And actually, to my astonishment, leaks from the future is a, the slightly, but it's the, it's the one least observed. And in my experience, it's the one that most often happens. So I think there's a gap there where some, there's some hidden leaks that aren't, being, that aren't being caught. Medical diagnosis, they're very subtle in some ways too. A medical diagnosis company we worked with was trying to do a better job of identifying diabetes through uh, infrared light being shown through the skin and reflecting off of the blood uh, blood and, ref and coming back. And so there was a lot of hard work to take away the person-specific information that's in the skin related to their age, their gender, their sex, uh, I'm sorry, their, uh, their race and so forth, uh, how much they work outside, whether they have lotion on, what sort of, you know, all sorts of things you have to get through the skin and then get to the common blood chemistry that we all share and get that diagnosis. They were really, really very, very successful in many different ways, lots of different applications for it. But one of their failures was related to, um, they did a simple, I mean, they made this mistake over and over and over again where they used information from the future um, and didn't properly segregate it. And so in one case, they built principal components as a feature of the data and then used the principal components in modeling by separating the data into training and to testing. Now, what did they do wrong? Why, why did, did their out-of-sample data on truly new data they'd never seen before underperform their evaluation data 
Well, they had done principal components on all the data. So if there was an outlier or something, the principal component already knew about it. It already was pointed in the right direction to take that outlier into account. You cannot do feature creation on all the data. You have to use only the training data, and the evaluation data has to be segregated at all times. So it happens a lot. Um, well, a couple more stories, lots of different fields, but uh, let's just summarize it, uh, summarizing it a little bit backwards. The, the leaks from the future mean that we can't really trust results. The ensembles tell us that we can't do it alone. And targeted shuffling says some of our success is luck. So, you know, it, it, be, it becomes a very humbling exercise to, to learn these things as you realize, you know, we're alone, no one loves us, we're going to die. You know, it's like, you know, it's not, it is, no, it's not that bad, but it's, it's, it's weak. And even and cognitive biases also tell us that we can't really trust our own, our own judgment. So we really need other people, we need teams, uh, we have to have a, a skeptic's eye, and that really helps to have another person try to red team it, try to break into our model and bust it, because we, if we'd thought of it, we'd have, we'd have built it better in the first place, right? So teams are really important. We need those alternative perspectives, and simulation can be a real leveler to tell us how likely we could have cherry-picked such a good result from random results, and it's a very humbling experience. But it's doable, and the good news is almost every project succeeds if you do it right. The bad news is if you do it right, your results are always worse than if you cheat. I don't know if you noticed that, but, but they hold up better out of sample, and that's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think we have time for a quick question. Um, so. Again, thank you. Very, um, very interesting, um, humbling uh, <laughs> view of how hard it is to actually do good data science. And, and the interesting part, I suppose, comes up is the teamwork aspect. And um, a lot of times, um, PhDs are done on their own, and they get in the habit of writing thousands of lines of code and producing reports and results. But how would, you, in, in more of a commercial, where, where there's like a re result that you know, has to work, and you yeah. have to get the right answer, how would you kind of facilitate teamwork and that kind of robust discussion that needs yeah, to happen? Yeah, there's a couple of things. One is mm. Google had done a really good study on effectiveness of teams. Mm. And the key finding there was a, a property they called cognitive safety. Is, mm. is it safe to throw out an idea, to criticize, to brainstorm? You know, are you, are you listened to? Are you, are, you, can you, are you in a safe environment for experimentation and mm. failure? That's extremely important. And many of us in the field, not me, but many of folks in the field are introverts and really want to take the work, polish it, and get that blue ribbon when it's all done, and, and you're going to polish the wrong rock. You need to talk to the client at least once a week, you know, briefly, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, but you have to have that interaction. Also, that builds in their buy-in to the solution. They're much more likely to actually apply it if they've seen the sausage being made. So. Mm -hmm. Very important. I absolutely agree. Very, very good. Um, thanks so much, John. More of that tomorrow at the All masterclass. Right. And um, as I say, there's still availability.